Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders in every single province and territory in this country called Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with City of Miramichi, New Brunswick, Councillor Sam Johnson. But before we get into today's interview with Councillor Johnson, I just want to ask you to do a favor for us, if you haven't already. Head over to Facebook, head over to Threads, head over to Twitter, and search Cross Border Interviews. Subscribe, like us, follow us for more behind-the-scenes information, for stories about what's happening in municipalities from across Canada, and learn about upcoming guests on this show. It helps us get the word out, but it also helps you stay informed of what's happening on the Cross Border Interviews show and also Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown. Now, on to our interview with Councillor Sam Johnston. Councillor Sam, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with a general question, but it's the question that is the crux of what this whole interview is about. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Councillor? Well, Chris, thanks for having me today. And uh, a great big how's she going from the mighty Miramichi here in northern New Brunswick. We are indeed the gateway to the north and the northern part of the province. And it's great to speak with you today, Chris. My thanks. motivation for getting involved in municipal politics, and this is going to sound uh, maybe a little quirky, actually first started with uh, some former customers I had from my paper route as a young lad. And I uh, moved away, <laughs> yeah, I moved away uh, to Munton uh, for a while with my work uh, with the federal government, moved back home, and some of the seniors, now seniors, in my old neighborhood, when they inadvertently saw me at the grocery store or at the rink or around the community, uh, more than once mentioned to me, that they'd like to see me run for municipal politics because they wanted someone they could trust and rely on on council. And uh, they felt that I would make a worthy candidate for that position. So I thought about it uh, and put my, threw my name, threw my name in the, on the ballot. And uh, I won a spot. So it brings up a good question. You you, br you you talk about community, you talk about that paper route, then moving away, and then people asking you to run. Had you considered it beforehand, though? Had you considered that one day, maybe in the near future, I might want to be a councillor, a mayor, an MP, an MPP? Wh or what, what, what did your desire come from? Was it just someone asking you and saying, okay, I'll do it? Or did you have sort of an itch beforehand? That's an interesting question, Chris, because indeed, uh, while living away, so to speak, from uh, the river, as we call it, Miramichi, I was approached uh, to run um, at, uh, at another level of uh, political involvement. I considered it, weighed my options, but uh, felt that it was a little early in uh, my career at that point to make the jump into provincial and or federal politics. However, once I got home, I did a little more investigating into the issue, and uh, I realized that I could run for municipal politics, maintain my career, and uh, contribute uh, to my uh, career, my day job, and at the same time, make a viable contribution to my community right here at home in Miramichi. So when was the first time you put your name forward in an election? The first time I put my name forward in an election was actually uh, during the municipal election. I didn't uh, put my name forward before. I was considered uh, for different positions. I started the process and didn't finish it. Uh, it was just too early for me. And uh, I liked what I was doing. I, uh, I'm now at a point in my career where I'm towards the, the uh, tail end of it, so to speak. And uh, I'm enjoying my tenure as a municipal politician and uh, feel that I am making a difference for the citizens of Miramichi. 
Do you mind me asking what year that was? Because I, I, I traditionally try not to do a lot of research on my guests because I sure. want my guests to learn, teach my get audience and me at the same time, because I find that's more of a natural progression. And I find that if mm. I know all this stuff about you, then I'm just going to ask you random questions. I like the natural progression. So what year did you put your name forward? Uh, I was working as a, a senior manager and I was approached in 2020 ish to, uh, consider consider a career in politics i i thought about it it's very it was very intriguing to me it was another way to contribute to my community to my greater writing if you will to my province and um like i said it just wasn't the right fit for me at the time but the uh the municipal option was there and when that opportunity came uh, upon me i i took advantage of it so i want to go back to the election then and i want to talk about the issues because Someone who's involved in their community kind of believes that they have an understanding of the issues that their community is facing. But when you door knock, when you actually go talk to people at their front door or actually meet with them at the grocery store and you hear the sort of the issues that they're facing, it can sometimes be an eye opening experience because what you believe and what the reality is can be sometimes different for you when you were talking to residents, when you were talking to people. Were they talking about issues that you thought people would be talking about? Or were there some sort of, oh, I didn't think this was an issue moments for you? I would have to say both. Um, and I'll start with the issue that I didn't think was such a salient point at the time that truly hit home to me after I got involved. And that is the issue of housing, affordable housing. Uh, and remember, she at the time, specifically a place to live, because when I first considered running uh, for municipal politics, we had less than, uh, I would say, one, two percent vacancy rate on the river in terms of even getting an apartment. Real estate rates with COVID, with folks coming from uh, upper Canada, up in Ontario and moving back out here, uh, they'd sell their house for a, a pile of money and buy a house here at a lot cheaper. There was Real estate prices went up as a result of that. So housing became an issue to me that I, although I realized that, you know, folks always, you know, it's a human right to have a warm, safe place to live. I just didn't realize here in Miramichi, it was such an issue. And it truly is. And we've made a lot of progress on it, by the way, since uh, I've joined council about two and a half years ago. One of the things that I fully expected to hear about and did uh was two flashpoints in this area. One is the lack of infrastructure on the northern side of the river. So remember, she is a unique city geographically in that we're an amalgamation of two former towns, the former town of Chatham, the former town of Newcastle, the villages of Logieville, Nelson, a local service district, Chatham Head, the village of Douglastown, Nordine, and part of lower Newcastle Ferry Road. So a lot of a wide geographic area into one city with a population of only about 17 and a half thousand people. Now on the Southern side of the river, we have a road that traditionally went along the edge of the river, uh, along with the, uh, our traditional area wood, wind and sail where I, I, we were an area of timber and, and pulp. And uh, the road was built along the river on both sides. But on the Southern half of the river, there was a bypass built to access Chatham. So you had two options to get there. But on the northern half of the river, there are still just the one main thoroughfare. It goes by the name of the King George Highway, aptly named after good King George. And it's actually provincially designated, even though for a good part of it, it's a residential, it's a residential street. It's not really a highway. And there's eight or nine stoplights from one end of the city to the other. Well, we don't have another option on the northern side of the river to get to the provincial capital, Fredericton. In fact, if you want to go from the Peninsula de Cadignan, the Canadian Peninsula, or northern New Brunswick to get to the provincial capital, you have to go through the King George Highway and approximately eight sets of lights to get through the former town of Newcastle and the village of Douglastown to get to Fredericton, the provincial capital. It's ridiculous. It's 2023. It's not 1953. Marmachie needs an alternate route on the northern half of the river. And I sure did hear about that when I went door knocking and I expected to hear about that. Um, you have just mentioned a name that is near and dear to my heart and that is the uh, Newcastle. 
Uh, I'm originally from a town in New Ontario called Newcastle. I was on a oh. on a international board of Newcastles of the world, and really? we always talked about Newcastle, New Brunswick, and it is so great to be able to chat with someone who represents Newcastle. Well, I gotta I... tell you, Chris, it is a little slice of heaven right here in Newcastle, New Brunswick, the Newcastle neighborhood of Maramachina. <laughs> I, I, I ran for my first municipal office in Newcastle, Ontario. So this is kind wow, of serendipitous for me. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about the role of a counselor. Before we talk yes, about indeed. the city of Miramichi, I want to talk about the role of the counselor. Now, you, you've been in the role for two and a half years now. And there is a weight and responsibility that you are put under as a local elected official you don't go off to your capital to do your job you don't go off to auto to do your job you make a decision you're in the grocery store the next day and you feel the impact these people will stop you how much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself every time you go into that council to make sure that the decisions you make the decisions you make as a counselor as a council impact the most people but doesn't impact them in the wrong ways well uh, it, it was, I, I've, I've, for the last 20 plus years, I've been in leadership positions with a lot of responsibility, burden of command, if you will, to use a military term. And when you're on a municipal council, as they say politically, you are definitely in the weeds. And when you make a decision, it directly impacts the lives of the folks, not only, uh, you know, in your city, but in your neighborhood, your family. Uh, your friends. And when you go to the grocery store, you go to the gym, you go to the, the we call it the show here, the movies, um, you're going to be asked questions about the decisions you made. And sometimes you have to face tough questions, but I've never had a problem wearing my own heat, so to speak, and backing up my own decisions. Because I have to tell you, Chris, my pillow is my peace of mind. I weigh out every decision carefully. I try to make ethical decisions for in the best interest of the community and uh, the most people affected. And I go on that with each and every decision I make on council. I take it very seriously. Sometimes folks think, uh, think being on council is simply a meeting once a week, every Tuesday night, but it's actually much more than that. I field calls on a regular basis. I'll go meet with people face to face. I go out into the community on a regular basis and check out situations in terms of infrastructure or complaints or different things to make sure that there's validity to them. And if I can support them, I will. And advocate for those people. Now, mind you, I guide and, and approve policy. I, I'm not in the operations of public works and that sort of thing per se, but I can sure make the right people aware of the issues. Is it hard to balance that? Is it hard to balance what is good for the community with what people want from the, their council? Because your decisions are going to impact everyone. And sometimes, and you probably have realized this after two and a half years, you're not going to mm -hmm. please 100% of the people in your community, but you have to do the best job and make sure that people understand that you are doing the best job and give a respect to the people who are going to, as you said, quote, give the heat, people who are going to be upset with you with the decision you make. And you have to be able to sit there and listen to them vent, even if it's for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, but mm -hmm. do it in a respectful manner. Do you not? Absolutely. And that's a, that's a, that is a balancing act. It takes a lot of compassion. It takes a lot of patience. And one always has to remember when they step into public life, be it the municipal level, the provincial level, the federal level, you are indeed a public servant. You are a servant to the citizens of the area that you represent. And yes, at times it's challenging. There's no, there's no question about that. But in my short experience on council, I have found no different than my other professional life that when people understand, when people understand various municipal issues, they may not get what they want but they get what they need. And that's my definition of fairness, getting what you need as opposed to necessarily what you want. And that is to be understood, that is to be heard, and that is to be respected. And that is my philosophy in terms of inter interacting with citizens of the city of Miramichi in terms of being your city councilor.
I have done over 150 of these interviews uh, with municipal leaders from across Canada, and I have chatted about the apathy when it comes to municipal politics a lot lately, uh, with mm -hmm. people more paying attention to what's happening federally or provincially, particularly what's happening in New Brunswick of will they, won't they call an election, but here we yes. are. Do you, do you see Lots of political drama in New Brunswick these days. Oh, it, it helps me get through my day, but do Indeed. you see an apathy when it comes to municipal governance? When you ask people for their opinions, are they willing to give you their opinions? Or do you kind of have to like pull it out with like tooth by the tooth and nail to try and get someone to engage with you? What is the apathy like around municipal government in Miramichi? Well, Chris, let me tell you, the Marmashiers are, we are, we have a unique little subculture here in Marmashi, and we are gregarious, welcoming people, but we have no problem at all telling your opinion. And that uh, goes definitely for the citizens of this community. They have no issue whatsoever making known the issues on their mind, uh, the issues of concern. In fact, I have an open Facebook page. Uh, Councillor Sam Johnson, and I will post the issues. I will respectfully, I guess you could say, debate or explain the issues publicly. I am not afraid to uh, to uh, debate issues publicly or to let folks know where I stand. Um, and again, I have stood alone on council on certain issues because I'm guided by three things. My values, what are, what are important to me, uh, my ideals, what guides me and my beliefs, what I know to be true. And if my decisions align with all three, then I make them. And if I'm alone, so be it. How much of this? Okay, you bring up a good point. And I apologize if I ask this inappropriately, but I just want to try and get this out correctly. I, I, I commend you for that, for having those three guiding principles to make decisions. But when you go into that council chamber, though, your guiding principles are set. But you have to be open to the idea that a fellow counselor may give you an idea or an option or say something that may change your mind. So how important is it for you to be grounded in those principles, but open to potentially swaying your vote, whether it be someone from a delegation presenting in front of council or a counselor saying something and saying, oh, I didn't think of it that way. I might be able to change my vote and maybe vote for or against something. 100%. And as I explained to you earlier, in my previous life, I have been an executive manager and a senior yeah. manager. I know what it's like to be the head of a team. I know what it's like to be a team member. I know what it's like to be a people accessible leader and to have to engage other people, solicit their opinions and their thoughts, and then incorporate those in the final decision so we can move forward as a team. And I am blessed as a municipal council member because we truly do have a team and we make decisions as a team we may not always agree human conflicts natural when a group of folks in a room when you're dealing with contentious issues but once we make a decision as a team we move forward together you 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 uh you've been on council for two and a half years now and i gotta ask the sort of the look back question here before we turn to the uh bigger issues of the town i want to know what would you tell yourself two and a half years ago if you were to sort of be transposed back then before you got into municipal politics? What advice would you have wanted to have known before taking this leap and sort of directing the path forward with your fellow councillors of the town of Miramichi? I would have to say that I underestimated the role. There's a lot more to being a municipal councillor then meets the eye at face value. You, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of commitment. You know, I look at folks in particular getting involved in municipal politics. It's a part-time job, if you will. But in essence, really, it's a full-time job because you may only attend a meeting once a week, but you're always Councillor Johnson or Councillor Sam. That's the title that I have now in my community. I was never that before, but I sure am now. And there's a lot there's a lot to learn in terms of municipal process, how that ties in to provincial process and provincial law. The other thing that was rather daunting, in addition to eye opening, is just how dependent municipalities are on their provincial government 
who are in turn dependent on the federal government. So I didn't quite grasp the interconnectedness of it all, but uh, that's been a bit of an epiphany for me for sure after two and a half years. Uh, you mentioned a subject that I talk about a lot on the show is about the balance of a municipal life, because you're right. You you are Councillor Sam the moment you leave your house. When you're inside your four walls at home, you're just Sam. You're just relaxing. You can just take it off and just, just decompress. But when you leave, even if it's just to go get milk at the store or go to a restaurant and just relax for a few hours, you are always Councillor Sam. So in two and a half exactly. years, have you found that balance where you can just be able to have those stressful days where you're talking to people constantly, having those tough decisions, but then balance it with saying, okay, I need to just be Sam today. And if that means that I have to just lock myself in my house and not talk to anyone, I'm going to have to do it. Well, I tell you, that's a, it's a, it's, it's an intriguing question, Chris, because work-life balance, and I'll, I'll be completely candid, work-life balance has always been a challenge for me. I, I can throw myself into my work, and uh, if I didn't have my my loving wife to kind of tell me to back off a bit and that there's other things in life besides work, I'd be at it all the time. And that is indeed the danger when I would say at any level of politics, but particularly municipal politics, because truly you're only supposed to be doing a part-time job in small municipalities like mine. Now, I, I like uh, how you say 17,000 is a small municipality. Every other place yeah. would not say that, but okay, right. small municipality is Mayor Bashir. Well, we're a city in New Brunswick, <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm sure that folks in uh, Southern Ontario or BC or Southern BC or, you know, the Sud de Quebec, they have a great laugh at that because that's maybe a small town there, but we kind of think we're a city. We like to perceive ourselves as a city. And it, it is. It, in all seriousness, one has to decompress at times. You, you can't work day and night. You have to give yourself downtime. You have to forget about the issues. The main thing is to, and I'll say this, I'm a martial arts instructor as well. I have a martial arts club. And when it comes to, I, I one of the martial arts I teach, I teach several, but one of those Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So when you roll or spar in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, my mantra is keep it playful, keep it fun. Don't go, don't be too intense and, and, you know, explosively move and stuff like that. You'll get hurt, especially when you get older. So in my council experience, I try to keep it playful. Now we're dealing with serious issues. There are no jokes. But at the same time, I try to have fun with being a municipal counselor. I try to focus on the positive of being a municipal counselor. I try to focus on those issues that I can truly make a difference in the lives of Ramashiers from my role as a counselor. And when I do that, uh, I find I manage my stress and cope better. I appreciate that honesty and candor, but I want to turn to the city as a whole now. And I want to ask about the issues. But before I do that, I'm going to preface this whole conversation with this statement. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not a uh, direction of council. This is the councillor's opinion. I need to make sure I get that on the table so people don't assume that this is a policy of the city. It's not. It is an opinion. Councillor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode today, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Miramichi today? I would say, and again, due diligence wise, these are my own personal opinions, not that of my colleagues or city hall. I would say right now in the city of Miramichi, we have an issue. Uh, first, I'll get to issues. Not that it, this one doesn't matter, but I'm going to give you two issues. The primary issue is one that's a nice to have. The secondary issue is one that is something we absolutely must do, not only as a municipality, but as a province and a country. First issue, we are in the throes right now of finishing a daunting 10-year process of finally getting a multiplex established in Miramichi. That is to say, a centralized recreational facility that will replace, for the most part, all the other recreational infrastructures within the city limits. 
So on our former CFB, uh, Canadian Forces Base Chatham, there's a massive rec center that was built in the 50s called the Golden Hawk Rec Center, named after the Air, Air Force squad. That's going to close. The much beloved Lord Beaverbrook Arena, named after Lord Beaverbrook in Chatham, it's a, it's a cold old barn, but it has a lot of members to a lot of people. That's going to close. We're slated to close two outdoor pools, an indoor pool, and a rec center, the Linden Rec Center in Newcastle that I grew up playing sports in, and that's very near and dear to my heart. This elicits a lot of emotion from people for a variety of issues. Uh, they have emotional connection to these buildings. They are resistant to change. And then comes a dilemma in this city of where do you put the rec center? And we chose, well, I didn't choose, previous council chose, caveat to that, I had nothing to do with that decision, and I don't agree with it. They chose to put the multiplex in the former village of Douglas Town. Because, in my opinion, the petty rivalries of the past between <laughs> Chatham and Newcastle got in the way of taking advantage of the number one recommend recommended location by an independent consultant, and that was toward the waterfront on one end of the downtown of one of the towns called Newcastle. Now, this is my prediction. If that rec center, that multiplex, had been built in Newcastle on the former Anderson Mill property, as it's known, downtown Chatham would have benefited. It is the best hotel on the river. Downtown Newcastle would have benefited. Both downtowns would have grown and thrived as a result of that location of that multiplex. But because it was chosen to put the multiplex off the... Uh, Route 11, as it's known, I, I think it also doubles as a, known as the Trans-Canada Highway through Northern New Brunswick in the former village of Douglastown. A new hotel will eventually go there. That's my hypothesis. And neither downtown will develop. So in essence, rivalries from the past, the city lost an opportunity to cut their own nose off despite their face. Again, in my opinion, I don't agree with the location. So I want to pick the up fact, on that for a second. Yeah. I just want to ask this question because you're right. You you weren't part of that decision, so I don't want to talk about the 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 the, the past. I want to talk about the here's and nows. They've made the decision. It's going to be up uh, in the on the highway. Uh, that means, as you said, in your opinion, the two downtowns of the former communities of Newcastle and Miramichi will not benefit, uh, or Chatham and of uh, uh, Newcastle may not benefit from that growth. May not benefit as Chatham. much as they exactly. would. Exactly. But you have to now live in the reality of what's been decided previously. How do you see yourself in that role in ensuring that growth does happen, that growth does right. come down to the downtown? Because what's, what's past is past. What's here and now is the decisions you have to make. Well, that's an interesting question because concurrent to the multiplex, we also have devised two downtown redevelopment plans. So um, this council and, again, the predecessors from the last councilor, we're proactive in the sense that the focus on downtown development was all, was there concurrent to the evolution of this multiplex and the location that was chosen. So that that's well underway in both downtowns. And uh, there are some challenges for sure, but I think we're trying really hard. We just did some downtown renovations to uh, historic Chatham Business District and the Downtown Business Association in Newcastle. And I think both were positive, both approved to to be assets to both downtowns, in my opinion. And I think there will be long-term uh, benefits as a result of the, both of them. But you're right about, you know, now that we have the location and we're at the point now where the design has been made and the floor plan has been made and the preliminary work to be proactive and before actual construction is being put in place, that we're, as a team, we're supportive of the multiplex and, as a council and we're supportive, generally supportive, what well, we have to be, of where it's going in the location. So those types of, the, the, that's the, the, you know, horses left that barn. So, but now we have to make the best of what we have, and we're getting a new, modern, and I would say world-class multiplex, a modern facility in Miramichi to replace old, antiquated money pits that need to be replaced. Now, I didn't necessarily, when I first got on council, first elected, I wasn't totally convinced of 
cost-benefit analysis, economies of scale long-term, as to whether or not the new multiplex would be a fiscally prudent venture. I now have no doubt. I have, I have seen the numbers. We cannot afford not to have a new multiplex, and we, we're going to have an awesome facility. Of course, there's people that don't believe we should have the pool or the gym or we should have a second ice surface. We're, look, we're getting a world-class facility that people are going to be super impressed with. Every square centimeter of that, that place, is we're, we're squeezing as much juice out of this multiplex as we possibly can for the money we're putting into it. And I think at the end of the day, Marmashiers will be satisfied and happy with the product that they get. Access to it may be an issue, but we're also improving our transit system uh, concurrent to building the, the facility. So we're doing everything we can to debug this process before it's finally open. You have mentioned you, you were, you, you're here in your role as the city of uh, Miramichi's councillor. But you've mentioned Chatham, you've mentioned Newcastle, you mentioned Douglas, if I'm not mistaken. Douglas Town. Douglas Town. Um, you have to look at every issue as a mere machine issue. But there is probably still residents in your community who think of, I'm still a Newcastle resident. I'm still a Chatham resident. Ha, and they, do you think? <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, so, absolutely. And I, I apologize if this comes out of left field, but I've got to ask, how do you balance that? Because you can't look at individual neighborhoods as an issue neighborhood or an issue that's only affecting them. You have to look at it as a mirror machine issue and you have to bring people along to understand that. Is it hard to balance the needs of the entire community with the individual needs of each community that makes up the great city of mirror machine? Um, yes, it is at times periodically. Because in my opinion, yeah, everyone has unconscious biases. Everyone. Yeah. And it's human to, to be that way. But I will say, I truly do make an effort. If someone calls me from the, whether it's from Nelson, Chatham Head, Bushville, Chatham on the other side of the river. Uh, I was born in Chatham, by the way. That's where the Catholic hospital was back in the 60s. I have many friends and connections to that community. I'll do whatever I can to help them out to the best of my ability. Am I going to say that every everyone that's on council doesn't have unconscious biases and that we all have to check those at times? Certainly. I mean, I, I don't think that, uh, especially with eight councillors at large, um, I actually prefer a system that's a hybrid model. I would like to see three councillors at large on either side, of, uh, sorry, three ward councillors on either side of the river and two at large. Now, we've tried complete wards. That didn't work. Uh, there was a lot of dissension and, and just division, and it, it brought back the old natural rivalries that had existed for generations. But eight at large, uh, it's, it's not, I think it's an improvement, but I think we could do even better with a mixture of the two. You you were talking about the issues that you believe, and you were talking about this one, uh, the uh, multiplex being one of them. And I, I kind of interrupted you in that middle of that statement, so I'm going to let you continue. You said there was two issues that you believe the multiplex being one. What was the second one? The second issue is something that I've seen in my uh, professional job uh, for for years, and that is uh, the issue of addictions and mental health. And that also is a segue into homelessness, back to the affordable housing issue. I think one is connected to the other. Marmachi, not unlike any other uh, city or town in the province of New Brunswick, in fact, across the country, as we're coping with the terrible scourge of methamphetamine in our community. It is heartbreaking to see uh, so many young people, in fact, people of all ages, addicted to such a terrible terrible destructive drug and the havoc it wreaks in their lives and i do believe that as a community as a province as a country we need to do more to number one be proactive against uh, methamphetamine and, and opioids but methamphetamine is the latest generation of drug that people are really getting hooked on it, it's cheap it's readily available and it's very destructive and harmful and I think we need to have an iron fist in the velvet glove, so to speak. We need to combine 
accountability and responsibility with compassion and interventions. We need to get the right mix and balance. And right now in our area, the province of New Brunswick, we do not have that. We need provincial and federal support, particularly since healthcare is a provincial issue, provincial support to get hospital beds here for specific to mental health and addictions and have that intervention, long-term, therapeutic, dedicated addictions beds beyond our little detox we have here. It's just not cutting it. We need assistance from the province in terms of dealing with addictions. We need those hospital beds in Marmachi, and we need them now, specific to addictions and mental health. So I'm going to burst your bubble here for a second, because you're right. You uh, driver. This is, this, this is a provincial issue. This is health care at its core, and health care is a provincial jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But, and this is the big but, municipalities are the front lines. They're the ones who are dealing with this. And the provincial governments in you in your two years, you have seen it probably, can take forever to come to the table. They look at large communities and then they go through and say, how can we help? And they have their own set of priorities that they want to address first. And sometimes communities and sometimes issues get fallen through because it's not a priority for them. What does the city of Miramichi have to do in the short term, right here, right now, to address these issues, to make it an issue that the provincial government has to deal with? Because unless the province comes to the table, the municipality is going to be stuck holding the bag and the issue is going to get worse and worse until it's a pandemic or an epidemic. I like your expression, stuck holding the bag, because that's exactly the way that we feel. And in my opinion, again, that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you the example. I, I hate to quote the movies, but winter is coming and it's going to be cold and uh, very, very uh, harsh outside in, in, the, in the coming weeks. And we don't have a right now last year at the very last minute, although a provincial responsibility. Um, and we have excellent provincial partners here, the staff awesome they did what they could we threw together a warming center in a former rec center uh near a, a multitude of businesses close to the downtown in the former town of newcastle in order to have a shelter for folks that were homeless due to addictions in the winter time that's not going to fly this year because that building as i mentioned with the multiplex is being decommissioned so we have to come up with an alternate location, and we do have a plan in place working with our provincial partners and the individual departments in the area. The staff are great. The staff are doing their best. I believe we need more communication with the provincial government, more positive communication with the provincial government, and in turn, more support. Because right now in New Brunswick, we are facing what I believe is, and I'll say it, a wee bit of a crisis in terms of our municipalities. You see, we went through municipal reform, a massive municipal overhaul in our province in the very recent past, concurrent to massive overhauls with our regional service commissions, the delegation of duties and divisions of responsibilities, and it has caused a lot of fear, a lot of dissension, and a lot of confusion, particularly when it comes to budgetary issues, can these new former local service districts that are now incorporated into these entities afford to pay their taxes? And they're looking at the, the already established towns and cities as, a, as almost as the enemy almost. And, oh, they're, they're going to take us over. and We're going to have to pay for, you know, there was a big misinformation put out by certain local politicians that the, the multiplex was going to be, have to be paid for by folks that weren't, you know, outside of the city, which is complete malarkey. But you have to fight back against that uh, misinformation. You have to try to work your way through these steps and come up with conciliatory uh, solutions and work together in positive fashion. All that being said, I think the province made a mistake by bringing in municipal reform concurrent to the reform of the regional service commission at the same time. It was just too much. And uh, it's resulted in some issues here. So about those issues um on a good day 
of their uh, municipal leaders uh, have to sort of deal with the jurisdictional rules that you are under. Municipalities have a role. Provincial has a role. Federal government has a role. But when you go through a transition like you've just described, the jurisdictional roles kind of get blurred. And you don't know what's a provincial issue, what's a federal issue, what's a uh, or a provincial issue or a federal uh, municipal issue. But you do because you're elected and you read the MGA. Not everyone does that. When you deal with people, when you have people talk to you, are they getting confused on what is a provincial issue and what is a federal uh, a municipal issue? Oh, absolutely. They're getting confused as to where the boundaries to the city are now. So <laughs> never mind the issues. They, 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 some folks are still figuring out where they live. That having been stated, you know, uh, in fairness to the provincial government, it had to be done. Municipal reform had to be done. We had several hundred uh, municipalities, local service districts. It was all mixed up and it hadn't been changed in years and years and years. And they brought it down to less than 100, which I, I in theory, I don't have a problem with. It's just that I... I think it would appear that too much was attempted too soon. And when you speak to issues with people, um, and it's a good point, folks, folks are, aren't able to discern in some cases what's the responsibility of the province. I mean, they had a hard time doing that before, at least of all now. In fact, I would even go so far as to say is our regional service commissions are still figuring out exactly what their new roles are. So, and the relationship between the regional service commissions and the municipalities, how does it affect your budgetary issues? How does it affect your staffing issues? How does it affect, you know, who takes on what role and who's responsible for what? And then you have to say, well, if Marmashi and we're, we're, are, we are the uh, main population center in, in this region of the province, how does that relate to other municipalities outside of us? And I have a lot of empathy for the other municipalities outside of the city of Miramichi, because they're, if, if you think we're adjusting, they're really adjusting. Because, you know, yeah, now you're taking two villages or two settlements, if you will, that have been always separate and had their own individual identity, and now they're part of the same entity. All of a sudden, in concert with that, the regional service commission roles change. It's a lot to take in in a short period of time. So I've been accused on this show of spending too much time on the issues that face municipalities because I seem to be a negative Nancy when it comes to this, but I think it's the important to talk about the issues. But I want to flip the script because I, I want to not be accused of being only negative on this show. I want to talk about the accomplishments. And you've already outlined one, that multiplex. That multiplex is a big uh, deal for a community of any size, particularly in this type of economic area. What do you see as the sort of the good stories of Miramichi, the the projects that you point to and you say, you know what, no matter what, this is what Miramichi is all about. These are the accomplishments that people need to know about. Mm. Well, to make a to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, just to go back to your previous comment, the challenges with municipal reform and the, the revamping of the regional service commissions provincial policies that were a sense thrust on to the municipalities. The good news is we're coping with it. We're working through it and we're going to continue to make it work. And, you know, any change is difficult. And, you know, there are some positives, like more people now are represented within their community in terms of municipal representation and things like that. So it's not all bad, but at the same time, it's, it's very new and it's a lot and it's causing it, it, well, it has caused, uh, let's say, uh, what they say locally, a bit of a racket in the sense that now we're faced with this situation and we have to work through it together and we're going to get there. We're, we're going to make it. So to the positives. Well, northern New Brunswick is in, uh, really, I, I will say this, it's, it's essentially fighting for its proverbial life, if you will, in the sense that if if you look at former municipal if you look at municipalities uh, some of them are former because they changed with municipal reform but some of the cities in northern new brunswick which would be small towns maybe in ontario or medium sized towns they've lost people they've lost mills they've lost the main center of their employment economic development ecdev is suffering in northern new brunswick so 
we are in a battle, if you will, a competition, not only for jobs, not only for economic opportunity, but for people. And one of the positives, and one thing I'm very proud of, and I give a lot of credit to our mayor, Adam Lorden, for this, is that he's laid the groundwork to make Miramichi a more inclusive, welcoming community for new families, for newcomers, not only to, to uh, Miramichi, but to New Brunswick, to, to Canada. And our population has actually increased oh, wow. in Miramichi since this council has went in. So I see that as a very positive development. And, you know, we have, and, and it's exciting because despite the challenges, we are growing as a city. And I see that as something that's, uh, that's a big accomplishment. I appreciate, uh, I, I know I told you at the beginning of this 45 minutes and about four minutes ago, I looked at the clock and I realized we're at the 40 minute mark and now we're at the 42 minute mark. Do you have an extra like five minutes that I can ask you the last set of questions here? Absolutely. Perfect. Fire away, it, Chris. It's my favorite subject because I, I think tourism is an important factor for municipalities to think about. And as a tourist who likes to spend his economic dollars ah. in Canada, I will be visiting Miramichi in the spring or summer of 2024. Uh, we're renting an We'd RV. We'd love to have you. Packing Bring lots dogs. of money. Exactly. So what should a tourist to Miramichi look to do? Or what are the hidden gems in Miramichi that people need to see when they come through the community? Look, I know this is a national podcast. You have people all over Canada watching this podcast. Come visit us in Miramichi. Come visit the mighty Mary Machine experience our river. We are indeed a little slice of heaven, the gateway to northern New Brunswick. We are known as the city of festivals. We have so many amazing festivals, some based along culture. We are Canada's Irish capital. We have our famous Irish festival. We have our rock and roll festival. Blast from the past. Come and experience the 50s again. Come to Mary Machine for the rock and roll festival our local indigenous communities, Naratogia, uh, Eskidobadich, Metapigiuk, their powwows, they're amazing. A lot of great folks, great fun. Our uh, Le Quinze, the Festival de l'Acadie. We have the Acadian Festival to celebrate. You want to talk food and singing and dancing and having a nice time? Come to the Acadian Festival. We have our Folk Song Festival. It's a long, ongoing tradition in Miramichi, a lot of times based on the lumber industry, when, when the men and women that worked in the lumber camps would sing songs, some of them are cappello, and uh, the, the, it's just a cultural icon. And it's so many great things to see and do. We have the longest zip line in Atlantic Canada. We have, uh, you know, Bull Bears Island, Middle Island Historic Park. So many wonderful things to do in Miramichi. Never mind the nice, friendly people that'll welcome you with open arms. I'm trying to keep up with all your the great things you're talking about. I'm like, oh my god, I want to do all of these things. Oh, and if you fish, we have the premier bass tournament here in Miramichi. We have one in the spring. We have one in the fall. The Striper Cup, and uh, we have some big rigs come from all over the country. Some from stateside and everywhere to come and fish bass here. It's it's the the river's full of boats. It's uh, very exciting. So I want to end on the million dollar question here, Councillor Sam, and that is, and I think it's an important question that all municipal leaders need to be able to answer, and I think they should be able to answer this. But in your opinion, what makes the city of Miramichi such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? In my opinion, what makes the city of Miramichi such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise your family is the people. Miramichi has always been about the people. You know, as an area, we faced adversary right from our very humble beginnings. Right after New Brunswick started to be settled, we, we had a, a plethora of Irish immigrants, Acadian immigrants, and, and some Scottish folk too, that came here early on, carved out a life for themselves here, and have faced 
constant challenges, the great fire in the 1800s, economic devastation with our timber industry, the closure of our base. We even had to cope with a serial murder here that made national headlines, international headlines. And Marmashi has always been resilient, always came out on top and always looked out for each other and anyone that comes to our community. Come to Marmashi, meet the folks here. And if you hear how she going, just say the very best and you'll fit right in and have a great time in Marmashi, New Brunswick. Counselor, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking 45 minutes out of your day and sitting down and doing this. Um, it, it, it sounds like, and I've only known you for about 45 minutes now, but it sounds like you have a real passion for your community and you have a real passion for making your community a better place. And I don't think municipal counselors hear this enough, but thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for serving your community and making your community a better place for not only yourself, not only the people today, but the people of the future. So thank you so much for chatting and for serving. C'était un plaisir pour moi, pour moi. Je vous en prie. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me. And I am indeed 100% Marmachir. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support either. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of this community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues what truly matter to you and to our communities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.